thank you so much for joining today's session where we will reflect and touch upon the racial history, discrimination in a very much of the UK as well as hopefully EMEA context. What started off as a conversation that was only potentially happening in the US quickly was felt here, be it through the systemic bias that has been around for centuries as well as the feelings that are felt by many. The history that we have here, as we know, is incredibly complex. We're not going to get to all of it in this one, one discussion. It's also not a straight line and runs really, really deep across Europe, Middle East, and Africa. The feelings that our colleagues are feeling, as I said, are real. They're feelings of sadness. There's feelings of enough is enough. Why is this still happening? And it's compounded with the social and health inequalities by COVID. As part of Bloomberg's ongoing commitment to inclusion, our Bloomberg Black professional community and Pan-Asian communities in London have come together for this session today to raise awareness and create a spirit of understanding, as well as a spirit of curiosity. We know this is a timely conversation. Yesterday was Windrush Day, which marks the legacy of a generation of British, African, Caribbean people who've helped define and shape Britain. A uh, quick housekeeping before we get started. Uh, if we lose connection, which hopefully we won't, please stay with us and we will get back to you. If you have questions for the panel, please IV them to my colleague, Emily Nathan, and we will address as many as we possibly can. So now I'm excited to jump into the conversation and introduce our panelists, both who have known and have tremendous respect for for many, many years. Paul Anderson Walsh, co-founder and executive director of the Center for Inclusive Leadership and the former CEO of the Stephen Lawrence Charitable Trust, um, who was in leadership post the time of the trial, which we'll hear more about, as well as Sophie Chanduka, global COO of shared services and banking operations at Morgan Stanley and founder and chair of the Black British Awards. Welcome. You would normally hear applause, so we won't get that to you today, but please know that we are all clapping. Neither of you are strangers to Bloomberg. We've worked with both of you over the years, so thank you very much for your time and bringing this conversation to life in the context of UK and EMEA. Paul, I'm going to have the first question for you, and we were joking before uh, while we were waiting for LiveGo to start that each one of the questions that I'm going to be asking the both of you could take a week or a month to answer. Sure. Um, and hopefully we'll have that time to continue the conversation, but in the interest of this conversation, um, you might have me interrupting you. Please know it is out of respect because I really want everyone to hear as much as they can from you on a variety of topics. Uh, so the first question, Paul, is for you. Um, you were... You are the former CEO of the Stephen Lawrence Charitable Trust, by the way, an organization that Bloomberg supports through Bob Diego. Um, in fact, at the time the trial ended after a long 18 years, you described the moment as partial justice. That moment has resurfaced to be more salient than ever, and you've continued to dedicate your professional and personal career to social justice and inclusion. Would love to, for you to share your thoughts as to what that even means, right? Who Stephen Lawrence is, what the McPherson Report is, and just reflect on where we are today. Well, firstly, thank you so much, Manisha. I'm absolutely thrilled to, to be on the panel with you. And it's an absolute delight to get to, for me to hear Sophie as well, who I'm super excited to hear more, more from. Um, how, how do I capture this for you in a couple of minutes? Well, I guess, I guess maybe to say this, um, the reality is that when we, we don't live in the past, but unfortunately the past has an unpleasant way of living in us. And so what we're seeing, when we're, particularly when we're looking at this conversation about racism, is, is this very stubborn problem, which I'll, and we'll talk more about. But when I think about this conversation, I, I came to this conversation, I was born into this conversation as, uh, as a child of the Windrush. And of course, my, uh, my father and my mother were born, came in to live in London in a time, well, not together, and not that they stayed together, that's a whole other story, came to live in London when they were signs in the windows that said, no blacks, no dogs, and no Irish. And what's interesting, I think, from my perspective is, I was very conscious at the time as I grew up, that really, when you talked about someone who was mixed race in the 60s, candidly, we were the dogs that the blacks and the Irish made. And it's, it's a very, very big conversation all of its own but i'll come back to that maybe another time but let's take the plumb line from lawrence because that's where you wanted to start and i think that's a great place to start 
So for those who don't know, Stephen Lawrence was an 18 year old young black man. He was stabbed to death at a bus stop um, in a completely unprovoked attack, 22nd of April 1993. And it became a real watershed moment in British politics and the whole range, or the whole conversation around, around racism and social justice. Um, interestingly, and the the event you re, you referred to when I talked about pastoral justice came 18, 19 years later when two culprits, Gary Dobson and a guy called David Norris, two of apparently five, were, were convicted of his murder. So it took extraordinary amounts of time to get justice for him but the Lawrence family and you'll know that of course were, were relentless um, what happened which was interesting was that the, uh, the the story really is a story about structural inequality and it's a story about criminal just injustice my, when I my tenure of the Stephen Lawrence Trust was about shifting the conversation from simply criminal justice to the question of social justice. And the reason I was interested in that was because had Stephen have evaded his murderers on that particular fateful night in April 1993 and got on the bus, the reality is that he would have still been confronted with such deadening social consequences that it would have killed any aspiration that he had had to be an architect. And that's just a, a blunt truth. And so but what happened was that so inept was the investigation and the, and the prosecution that the report that was generated from that was the famous McPherson report. And the McPherson report concluded that the Metropolitan Police were guilty of what they described as institutional racism. And it's a really withering indictment because how it's defined, and if I just explain this to you, it's really important because it's germane to our conversation. It's, dis it's described as being this, the collective failure of an organization to provide an appropriate professional service to people because of their color, culture, or ethnic origin. And it can be seen and detected in various ways. Um, unwitting prejudice, now that's interesting because it's not saying non-conscious, it's saying unwitting. And non-conscious means that I am, it's subconscious, that I do it unknowingly. But unwittingly means it's inadvertent or unintentional which is fascinating. Uh, ignorance, which is lack of knowledge or information. Thoughtlessness, which is a lack of thought about how your actions uh, can upset and, and, and offend people. And racist stereotyping, which is the notion of an idea that you might carry about somebody, um, especially an idea that's wrong. And all of this, Manisha, added up to become the, uh, the, the, this definition of how it discriminated against black people in particular. And um, stop me whenever you're ready. McPherson made 70 recommendations. Uh, and by the way, I should say that um, the institutional racism that was called out by McPherson wasn't confined to the Metropolitan Police Service. It was a wider piece than that. And may I say, although this story is a story about a black man and the, the black man, this black man, young Stephen Lawrence, and the black struggle is emblematic, but it's important to say that this is also an insidious problem that is impactful upon the Pan-Asian community as well. So this isn't peculiarized to the black community, although I think it's, there is a grade I could show you. But anyway, the point being was that there were these key, current, key um, thematic recommendations. A, a couple of them, one was about openness accountability, another was about uh, race awareness training, another one was about recruitment and retention of minority ethnic staff, another one was about the role of education to prevent racism. And fast forward, the question is, if I run the timeline, where do I get to? Well, what's interesting is, to your point, yesterday was Windrush Day. Windrush is the Windrush uh, uh, scandal in the climate of the hostile environment, uh, which came to visit my house, by the way, because at half past six one Saturday morning a few years ago, we had a panicked telephone call from my wife's sister who had received a seven day deportation notice. And she mm. had been in England since 1957. And it cost us seven and a half thousand pounds in legal fees, which, by the way, we haven't yet had paid back to us by the compensation scheme to fix it. Now, when Wendy Williams did her review in 2020, Wendy Williams said this. Remember, Lawrence is 1993. Williams said this in 2020. She said, while I'm unable to make a definitive finding of institutional racism within the department, I have serious concerns, said Williams. These failings demonstrate, and listen to the words, institutional ignorance and thoughtlessness towards the issue of race and the history of the Windrush generation within the department, which are consistent with some elements of the definition of institutional racism. So my point, the echoes of uh, 
McPherson are there in Windrush. And I think to your point, even though this work was started back a long time ago, it is still living and breathing and what people are experiencing today. For sure. On that note, Sophie, I'd love to bring you into the conversation as well. would love to hear your own process, if you don't mind sharing, about the full gravity about what you've been experiencing now in full disclosure. You have spent time across the world. So I would say you're a Zimbabwean background, spent time in London, and you're currently in New York, which is why we thought you'd be the perfect person to bring this conversation very much with that cross-cultural and very much living and breathing the story, um, or not even the story, it's just this experience. So starting with COVID and the impact that has had, had on the Black community and where we are today, what has been your own process of dealing with now? Mm. Well, thank you so much. Um, you know, good morning, Mangwanani, Sanibonani, wherever you are, to the South Africans. I wanted to um, just begin by saying, you know, we live in this privileged time where those of us who can be on these sort of conferences can actually have an opportunity to learn from each other and share our experiences. It's a privilege. I, um, with regard to COVID itself, I'm sitting here in Manhattan, smack in the middle uh, of Manhattan, not far Times Square. And uh, what is most I think anchoring for me is the realization of your mortality, right? Um, New York came from a bustling one day to nobody on the streets and a feeling, a distinct feeling that you were living in a morgue the following day. I have colleagues who live in Brooklyn who are describing how um, not many days after we were on lockdown, there were vans, you howl vans on their streets and they could smell dead bodies that were being maintained in the trucks on the streets in the United States of America, first world country. In those moments when I would look out my window the people who would be walking past, going into the office buildings to do security, to clean, um, to look after maintenance work, were all of a certain type. Um, it became very, very apparent, um, just from what I could see from the 26th floor, uh, that we live in a world that's so full of inequity. Um, and the healthcare system, particularly in this country, let a lot of people um, and you wonder whether it's actually deliberate is it intentional when you think about the history of why black people are in this country to begin with not having a health care system actually continues to disproportionately affect to annihilate to disempower to disenfranchise a certain population there's a part of it that says somebody continues to gain from a system like this um, there are many times um, I sort of have the debate with myself. Um, I love the work that's done by international organizations for many reasons, but sometimes I wonder whether there are some systems that exist, let's say in Africa, particularly in the development world, that seem to perpetuate a certain continuing, um, I suppose, a segregation, suppression, of certain people living in certain conditions. Um, someone is benefiting from the continuation of these systems and processes. As long as Africa needs somebody's help, black people will suffer, right? So I'm really conflicted because COVID um, is making me wonder whether this is a reckoning and a real opportunity for us to be honest about, you know, it's not enough I think as uh, one fantastic author and thinker has recently said, it's not enough to say I'm not racist. It's more important now to do something. And I would challenge every single institution that exists at the moment in the guise of development work, in the guise of looking after underprivileged communities, in the guise of powering previously underrepresented communities 
are we really doing this effectively or are we perpetuating systems that allow for a certain continuation of certain populations in a certain way? <laughs> right. Right. I, I'm very concerned about that. And that's what COVID has sort of provoked me to think about. Um, it's not enough to say I'm not racist. Right. Um, it's asking us to do more as citizens, as taxpayers, to challenge ourselves to do actions that demonstrate that we are disrupting the status quo and doing something about it. When you are doing something about it, then you can claim you're not racist. If you are neutral and sitting in your apartment watching, I don't think that's being not racist. I actually think that's not enough right now. Right. And so on that point, right, you spoke about health insurance, um, um, excuse me, health care. In parts of Europe, UK, et cetera, people have health insurance. Yet recently there was a report published by the Public Health England which clarifies the price that ethnic minorities pay in the healthcare system. There's so much data, right? And Paul, I'm gonna actually come to you over for this question. Mm -hmm. And to Sophie's point about like whose responsibility is it in the sense of like this bias exists and it's really, really big. It's a lot. What do we do with all of this? Because the data is there. We have the benefits when it comes to healthcare that the U.S. doesn't. Yet it exists here. Yet the discrimination and the inherent bias exists. Why? There's one of three reasons, and and I, I and Sophie, by the way, your your presentation is is has to be right. And the the perpetuation of racism there has to there, there has to be a there's a business model that it's attached to. So it's, it's, there's a logic to it. Otherwise yes, it just doesn't make it's sense. a business model attached uh, to it, yes. Of course it's a business model, um, and that's, which is disturbing at all sorts of different levels. But, but I think the thing that what worries me is the one thing I don't want to see happen is I don't want to see necessarily people jump into the immediate responses, let's do some research. Uh, Manisha just told you, the evidence is there. I don't need you to do any more research. I need you to do some mm -hmm. soul searching. I don't need you to do researching. It's time for soul searching because there are only three issues here. And by the way, I think the black community have review fatigue and we're entitled to have review fatigue. We've seen a thousand of them. But there's three possibilities and these are they. Either one, we want to do something about racism, but we can't. Two, uh, we don't, we, 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 we want to do something. We, we can do something about racism, but we don't want to. Or three, we can do something about racism and we will. And so we have to decide which of those three choices we're going to make because which of those three answers we're going to give. And I think what's interesting is I think that perhaps you're the, the I've talked about this uh, elsewhere, but I think that potentially what we found is we've reached this kind of moment of what I described somewhere, Sophie, as being what I call quantum entanglement between Floyd and COVID. Something's happened to lock those two things together. And what's been so interesting is that for the very first time in my extensive memory, what I'm seeing is I'm seeing that this conversation has finally pierced through the surface of humanity. And I'm going to put it that way around. And it's gone to deeper than the level of surface consciousness, because you can equally look out your, your windows in New York right now. And day after day after day after day, you're going to see people, a combination of people saying, we're done with it. This is enough. Um, because I think what's happened in this particular example is this has touched what I call the human heartedness of people. And when you reach the human heartedness of somebody, when you get down into their, let me use this language, into their soul and you touch their human heartedness, that always manifests itself in interpersonal love and caring about the way other people are treated. And I think that's what's happened. And so when you think, uh, Manisha, about the, the, the what do we do with all this stuff, the, the inequalities, because let me be honest, it doesn't matter what measure you take, I'll promise you the black man will always be less than in any study you want. doesn't matter what struggle you pick, it'll just be the case, whether it's health, whether it's jobs, whether it's housing, it doesn't make, it makes no difference. Um, but the, what's, what is different this time around is that white people are not just listening to us, What's happened this time is that white people are listening as us, and I've never seen that before. And that's very interesting to me. And so our job, it seems to me, is to be to figure out how do we uh, 
help people that want to take responsibility to become response able because we've seen this turning around in the kind of seat of human consciousness and it's it's very real there's no no one can deny that but the issue is this is that now you've changed your minds we need to keep the change <laughs> we need to hold on to this so what are we going to do and i feel like i was thinking that that, that we have to make this shift and i'll call it a shift from a shift from if to since see i don't want to be sitting here this time next year saying if only we did this and what i want to be doing is sitting here next year saying we're not there yet but since we've had this conversation we're now doing this that and the other mm -hmm. and i think if i was breaking out the shift from if to since i would say that the i in the if would have to be about a really deep level of introspection I would be about really looking in and asking myself the really important con conversation about what's my contribution to this? Because I tell you something, if you get this right at an individual just atomized level, there's a butterfly effect that could take place by one person doing one thing. It just and, and these small random acts, and I tell you story after story about it, but that first piece about recognizing that if there's enough butterflies, we can turn the whole we can change the entire system because that butterfly effect absolutely does work. But I think for that to enough in order for us to make I'll use this language, white people response able or able to respond. I guess the F would be, if I is for introspection, the F would have to be for forgiveness because we would have to come to a point where we could just draw a line in the sand and say, we can't, we can't fix what's gone before. We're not even into the future right now. We can just be here now. And now I'm going to create the environment where I'm going to listen in a, with forgiveness, I'm going to draw a line in a particular piece of sand and say, let's let's move from, let's be here now, let's do this, let's go from here. And I think if we could combine those two things, Manisha, I think we'd have an interesting chance. But I suspect, I greatly suspect, my ability, your, my white colleague counterpart's ability to introspect might have something to do with my ability to forgive, or to put it another way, to use your expression, in order for me to be really curious, I have to commit to not being really furious. Mm. That, that's amazing. Well, before I come back to you on how we actually make that a reality, I want to actually, Sophie, would love for you to share how you as an individual who's, excuse my casual language, but as a boss at work, as a big <laughs> man, is known in the community globally, how do you take care of your loved ones and yourself? Because this is obviously something incredibly personal because you're also an ally to so many people, right? But where do you take care of yourself in this conversation? So what um, I'm going to answer in probably a really sort of strange way, maybe. I realize that in this moment, there's been generations that have suffered and carried a burden that's heavier than the one I bear today. And so, to be honest, I don't get tired. I feel like I've been rehearsing all my life for this moment. Hmm. And um, what Paul is saying, my grandmother is alive. My grandmother lives in Zimbabwe. My lives in South Africa. I was born during apartheid. I was born in a non-independent Zimbabwe. I'm not old. I could sing liberation war songs before I could sing lullabies. And so I received this moment because there are black people who lived before me who have the privilege of white people and other people of other colors walking and acting beside us to say enough, talking at work about we have got to do better together and I don't have the answers. Imagine. My grandmother has lived to see that. The call that 
really um, moved me the most was when my grandmother phoned me and she said, I saw a video and my grandmother never phoned me. <laughs> you know, the grandkids always phone her. So she phoned me and she said, I saw a video. They lynched a black man. They lynched a black man. And everybody saw it in broad daylight. And nobody did anything about it. Is that where you live? This is my grandma who was a housemaid and lived through Susan. She's asking her grandchild. You live in a place where they kill people in broad daylight and nobody does anything. That's my heart. Right? Right. But we rise above it. We rise above it because my grandmother is still alive. And within days, she has lived to see multitudes of people across the globe stand up for other people. Thank you, Sophie. I don't get tired. Yeah, you don't. Because, you never sleep. because we have rehearsed for this moment all our lives. And we are living the privilege of generations that paid the ultimate price. Yeah. So I'm not tired. Yeah. You continue to do and be there for all, for which I thank you and we all thank you. So I'm going to say this, right? I, I agree that we are seeing people of all different backgrounds, stand up, say something, march, write an email, have a conversation at work. Part of me feels like, but we've seen it before, right? We saw it with Stephen Lawrence. We saw it with Rodney King. We've seen it all over the world, maybe not at this level. So, Paul, to your point earlier, this butterfly moment, it comes from a place of hope for all and actual change. But there are also people that are genuinely still afraid of having conversations to, who don't want to say the wrong thing. So, Paul, what is your advice? And actually, Sophie, to you as well, it's a question for both of you, to those wanting to start a conversation, as well as to those as how we can hold each other accountable, right? Because we can only, we can keep learning. There's so much data. But then how do we do it so your grandmother, Sophie, never has to see a video like that again? Because it doesn't happen, not because no one caught it on video. Uh, well, I'll answer, but I can't answer before I just have to reverence what I've just witnessed with Sophie, because this is the thing about this conversation, and this is what's different. You listen to a lady like this, and you know you're standing on holy ground when you're having this conversation. This is a very, very serious issue. Um, and so to hear... To just you just need to we can it was almost like we should have just stopped and just left it there and just left that moment sit there because that was the point but you're asking a practical question let me try and answer it for you let me do it this way around i, li I like the idea of, of keeping the entanglement between covid and and, and, and racism because i think there's such an interesting there's some interesting parallels so here's the thing that um, we're told all the time about uh, covid if you want to spread, uh, stop the spread of COVID, the really important thing is to wash your hands because you're supposed to constantly have clean hands. So that's a really big thing, right? So what I would say to you is this. I would say if we want to stop the spread of the racism virus, we need to start asking, we need to keep our questions clean. So in the one sense, you need to have a clean hands. And in this environment, you need to have clean questions. And um, clean questions are very interesting because the the most important thing we can do is to listen to each other in a clean way. And, and clean listening is a very, very unusual idea. It literally means to to come to every conversation, no matter how awkward an advocate you might be, no matter how clumsy a friend you might be, but listening in a clean way means that we come listening uh, to be naive, to be present, uh, to be open, to be not knowing, to be alert, to be aware, to be fascinated, to be eager to learn, and to be selfless. And when when we, when and if anybody ever listens to you in that way, 
when somebody listens to you in a way they're fascinated, they're not listening to try and filter or answer or, or contextualize, they're just fascinated. Um, something glorious happens because when people listen to us, uh, there's something so beautiful about that, that it creates and kind of makes us, uh, Mary, Mary, Mary just said this, he said it, uh, it creates us and makes us unfold and expand. And our problem is right now that we don't listen to each other. Sure, we talk a lot, but we don't listen to each other. So, so my big hope really would be that we would be really in the position to say to ourselves, here was our biggest contribution we committed to listening to one another in a clean way. And I listened to your, you know, working through all your white fragility and all the rest of the language you use these days. And you listen to me with my clumsy blackness and all the rest of it. But didn't know what it was. But I was, I was naive. I was present. I was open. I wasn't knowing. I was alert. I was aware. And I was fascinated. And I wanted to learn about you. I think that's brilliant advice. It's real. And it's something that we can all do. Sophie, would you want to add anything to that? Um, I tell a story, uh, Manisha, about the British Bulldog. <laughs> um, the British Bulldog, my boss. I worked for a man um, here in Morgan Stanley from Liverpool, you know. Grew up um, on a council estate. Uh, became a fantastic lawyer. Went up to tell you, has seen the world, works for one of the finest investment banks in the world. And um, the thing that I learned from my relationship with him, the British dog, is this. There's a gap in our educational system, no matter where you go. That means the narrative that would help us to understand why we are where we are is either just missing or is varnished in some way. <laughs> so I would say the first thing that we actually need to do is close the gap, right? I've already said to all of you, I was born and raised in Africa, but guess what? I didn't study African history in Africa. Grade one, right the way through, to the age of 16 when I left, I did not study African history. And so if I, the African who was born and raised in Africa, did not study African history, how do you even begin to comprehend and understand the multi-generational pain and trauma that you're now seeing, as Paul says? Paul says, our history lives in us. You know, Asia, as I sit here, I said in tears, I'd also be the first person to say, I feel like I've had great opportunities and that my race and my gender in and of itself, I don't feel that it's been a primary reason for my not progressing at a certain pace or what. I know it sounds ironic. I know it sounds weird given all of the work that I do. But I do this because I grew up in a majority black environment where I saw black success, black excellence. We saw black presidents. We saw black business people. We saw black doctors and nurses and teachers. We saw, you know, black women. We saw black. It never occurred to me that I couldn't. Right. Never! Until I got a passport. And it was stamped. Non-resident alien. It's a word that it's in my passport. Non-resident alien. Who calls other people an alien? That's what my passport said. And for the first time, I realized now I have to carry this piece of paper. And I get to the border, the guy says to me, you're a non-resident alien. Wow. Right? And I just never want any kid to grow up thinking that you should qualify yourself from dreams and imaginations because of the color of your skin. I never had to deal with that. And so I like to sort of spark the imaginations of other young children so that they can have a little bit of what I had, which is the sky's the limit. Right? Um, and so where do we begin? Let's go back to the British Bulldog and work. So, you know, I said, I really need you to help me. It's Black History Month. Could you please give me a speech just to open up an event, you know, because it's really important for it not to always be a Black person who's opening the event. He said, oh, Sophie, I can help. So he does the speech, and then he does a few other things for me, you know, for the African 
Caribbean Business Alliance at this. But then one day we're in the lift with a whole, whole load of other people, I have to say. And he says, Sophie, I don't know why you do all this stuff. Like, I'll help you because you always ask me, but you're going to be okay. Like, you're doing really well. I don't know why you think your race is a problem. I will do everything that you ask me to because, you know, apparently it's really important to you and I care about you. I really don't understand why you think you're not going to get ahead in life. And then I had to explain to him in that moment. I said, you know, pretty rich coming from you in this lift because guess what? When we get up to the 11th floor and we're going to meet the client, when you walk in the meeting room, your stock is 100%. My stock is at 40% at best. In those first 45 seconds, that person is probably thinking, okay, who's this person with Bill, and what are they doing here? Because when I open the dictionary of what a trusted advisor looks like, it's not like that. So now in those 45 seconds, I have to get my stock up to 100% because I'm defying this person's interpretation of who I am and whether I can be a sort of trusted advisor. I have to earn their trust, build rapport, connect with them in a way that they feel confident that I can do the job when we leave that meeting room. And I said, Phil, you never have to do that when you walk into a meeting room. I have 45 seconds to get my stock to 100%. You never have to think about that. Okay, so that's why I do this work, because I know that there's a different conversation that's to be had about the experience of a black person who doesn't appear in the dictionary when you look up the term trusted advisor, right? So then we did a deal, and he said to me, right, fine, so practically speaking, here's what we're going to do. And I said, yeah, okay, what's the plan? I'm going to do a roadshow. I'm going to come up with a reason to meet all of my stakeholders, all of the people who are important to me, the British Bulldog, in this organization in the next six months. I'm going to go to these meetings with you. The deal is this, you know, you're going to be the primary presenter, when the questions are asked, I've noticed what happens. It's true in the room. When the questions are asked, even if you've presented, people want me to answer the question. Mm-hmm. Our strategy going forward is you present, you're the expert, I'll defer to you. We'll introduce you to everybody I know who I've got currency with in this business. We'll do it over six months, right? And I get what you're saying. I'll use my stock. Mm-hmm. That you don't have to negotiate those 45 seconds every time we have a meeting. That's a very, very practical, practical idea which every single person on this call can do. Mm-hmm. Figure out how you use your currency. Figure out how you can open doors. Figure out how you can reduce that 45 seconds that a Sophie needs to negotiate to build trusted advisor status by lending your own stock. That's what you can do. And guess what? It's sponsorship, it's reverse mentoring, it's impact. You know, there's nothing more important than professional than to have stakeholders, sponsors who will propel them forward and protect them and advocate for them when promotion decisions are being made, when mid-year reviews are being done, when competition decisions are being made. So that's the practical stuff we should be doing in the workplace. But the first thing is we've got an education gap. Teach your children. Because my school curriculum sure is not doing anything about helping our kids to understand why on earth we are in this awful moment in history. Yes. Education, awareness, accountability, partnership, all of it. Show up in any which way that all of us can. I'm just going to pause for questions. Just another reminder that if you have any questions, please email Emily Nathan. We have like another 13 minutes left, and I could continue for a very long time, but I'm mindful of getting other questions in as well. Um, One question did come in, and um, Sophie, seeing that you live in the U.S., would love your thoughts on this. I'm going to paraphrase the question for someone who had just asked this, actually. is Do you think there will ever be something in the U.S. closely resembling the McPherson report, meaning do you envision a moment in American history where a report commissioned by the government would find the American police institutionally racist and propose a kind of radical remedies that the McPherson inquiry did? No. No. Because it's a federal structure. And... They can't even get health care sorted, right, right now, let alone race, relations, reform. Um, I think it was George Washington who called it the original 
factor in the founding of this nation. Um, and to be honest, the black sort of people come second. They were indigenous people who lived in this country first. So I think it's a bit strange. We even call slavery the original sin. It was not. The original sin was there were people who lived here before. And so, no, there's not going to be a report because there's no coherence in the, in the federal structure in that way. So, Paul, as a follow-up to that question, which is made up on the moment by yours truly, what made the UK, <laughs> and I don't love this word, right, but brave enough to do this and to call it out in the way that it did in a form of a report, in a form of an output that was so public? Uh, uh, that's an easy answer to that. Um, Dame Doreen Lawrence. Yes. She would not let it go. Yeah. She wouldn't let it go. And she she wouldn't let it go in the same way that a little girl called Greta Thunberg won't let it go in climate change. And so and <clears throat> Doreen Lawrence had a butterfly effect. That's my point. The one person just wouldn't let it go, and she just wouldn't stop. And it got traction, and it got traction. And of course, you know the whole the whole the whole story. You, you know, but mm -hmm. ultimately, if it hadn't been for the bloody-minded insistence of Dorian Lawrence, we would not have had had a um, McPherson report. Not not, not even possible. Mm -hmm. Was there anything missing from the McPherson report? Yes, living out the seventy recommendations. Yeah. That's my point, right? So, you, so we've got we've got the evidence. You you you've said it. We've got we've got the data. Um, the thing the thing is that it's got to it's got to go from. It, 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 I, I, there are two issues, um, Manisha, and they're both they're, they're hugely important. One has to do with the issue of individual racism, and the other one has to do with the issue of institutional level racism. So those and those two things are in are in tandem. Um, Sophie, for the record, the only difference between the United States and America is we're just more sophisticated at racism. Mm. Mm. It's mm. just more sophisticated here, Very um, mm. <laughs> and it's and because it's you know it, we it, you can go back to our, the story of the empire, and I mean I can just go on forever about it. But so it's it's done it's 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 done at a slightly it's it's, it's done at a different frequency. So it's more um, uh, as I say, there are headwinds in this country that white people don't hear. It's not the same as America. America is a very interesting uh, landscape for that. But I think because it's individual on one hand and it's institution on the other, uh, Manisha, that we have to kind of figure out how to deal with it. And I think, I think what's happening here is I think that you are now seeing such a people movement that the reality is we don't have a Nelson Mandela in this country, right? We don't have a, a Martin Luther King in this country. But what we do have is we have a, a groundswell of people who are working in an environment where we, we don't have statesmen, we have uh, politicians. And the interesting thing about politicians is they don't lead, they follow. And so the reality is, if there's enough noise, if there's enough of a movement, if there's enough pressure from the the, the electorate, then that gets things done. And b because literally they're gonna, they're not gonna want to put themselves in a position of unpopularity. And so I think that, I think we might see some pragmatic change. But I'm not somebody who's interested in pragmatic change. I want to see people. I want an, I want to see an awakening happen. I want us people to make the change because they see why. They realise. They they finally see us. To to Sophie's point, they see us as equal, not less than. So to that, I'm oh, sorry. No, no, no. That's fine. Please, Sophie, Manisha, is it okay yeah. if I ask a question? Please. Paul, I wanted to ask that. Um, so, in my own experience, right now in my company. What is helping us a lot is, you know, we have what I call gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. People who's standing in organization and whose sort of character and conviction is so fundamental to the fabric, right, of our, let's say, division, who are saying, I am going to lead this with, you know, but I'm going to lead this. I need your help, but I'm prepared to literally put my physical being in this space to make sure that we move forward. I am physically inserting myself into this process and will be with you. Just tell me how. With the Stephen Lawrence, what 
the the were there any allies in that process that you think it took courage they physically inserted themselves or are you saying actually it doesn't matter how you slice this cake had doreen lawrence not been as said fast and unflinching in her position you know this would have never happened so I think that I think there were a number of quite serious, significant actors in that particular piece of theatre. Um, one of them would have been the Home Secretary, who was Jack Straw, who was a massive, yes. advocate, massive yes. advocate. Um, yes. And I think Jack Straw was able to pull levers. I think that um, the QC of the time of the day was probably the most en vogue QC in the history of our country. A guy called Michael Mansfield, who was hugely influential. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, uh, a newspaper that um, certainly doesn't uh, normally get re associated with allying itself to black issues, a newspaper called the Daily Mail, um, took mm. a particular stance around Lawrence that was very, very unusual. So I think there were a number of things that were facts that wasn't Doreen in isolation. I think Doreen was the if you like the grit in the oyster, she just kept, you know, just irritating, irritating, irritating. And she, but she had these people, these gatekeepers that would come up because I think the truth of the matter is, Sophie, that um, candidly, only white people can end systemic, uh, uh, systemic racism. Black people can't do that. That's not possible. Yeah. So it's about whether or not, interestingly, black people, and here may be the twist in the tale, Sophie, maybe the secret is, that we as black people need to be allies to willing white people. Yes. Yes. I'm going to, I'm, I'm mindful of time, and I, I, I don't want to be mindful of time, but, but I, I know I have to be, out of respect for everyone. Um, we've talked a lot about the US and the UK, right? And obviously the region that we are covering right now is, is much bigger. When we think about what's happening, the protests have resonated in France, in Germany, and in, I, I won't even go to all the places because I will miss some place out. So it's the last question for both of you. Based on everything that we've talked about, based on everything that you have lived and experienced five years from now or 20 years from now, what do you, what is your biggest fear and what is your greatest hope? And so I'll turn it over to you first. Um, do you know, five years from now, I am pretty confident we're going to be in a better place in corporate. Um, PLC um, in in the businesses that we serve um, we need to be better off. My biggest fear is would we have championed, sort of, and catapulted ourselves forward as as a business, you know, to really maximise on the opportunity for change? Um, I think we'll move forward. I just don't know whether it'll be we will have seized the moment for its maximum capacity. Um, my biggest hope is we're going to see young talent find confidence and stride and become the next gen of leaders who have seen this moment, can challenge the process, will feel more courageous to speak. I think that generation of talent that's coming through you know, our, our new hires, our graduates, our millennials, the young people who have into the streets in New York, these are going to be the next generation of leaders. And so my greatest hope is in actually them because they seem to be able to just grab it and go for it. In the outside world, I worry that there won't be reform of any substance. You know, there, there'll be enough done to kind of keep people quiet, but I'm not sure that there's enough will in the political and policy zeitgeist to move us forward substantially as a society. Thank you, Sophie. Paul, mm -hmm. your fear, your greatest fear and your greatest hope. Um, so I guess my greatest fear would be this. Um, if I think about my father's generation, so let me make this very cultural. My father was a Jamaican and uh, my father's generation, uh, they consoled themselves by playing dominoes because it made them feel at home. Um, my generation are now the elders. I mean the elders generation. And I want to make sure that my generation has a domino effect so as our children can call it home. 
And I think that the last Sunday was the 100th anniversary of um, Father's Day. Uh, uh, President Coolidge, interestingly, endorsed the day once, and he said that the purpose of Father's Day was to impress upon fathers the full measure and the, their full obligation as fathers. And so my greatest fear is not that um, I would somehow miss a Father's Day, but I would fail to understand that this is the day of the fathers. And as a father, my job is to use my influence, is to use my voice, is to use the privilege that my father didn't have in order to bring about change. And I guess my greatest fear is that, um, is that I fail on that. But that fear is connected to my greatest hope. And my greatest hope is that in five years from now, my eldest daughter, a beautiful, beautiful girl called, uh, my eldest granddaughter, not my daughter, my granddaughter, will be 19. And uh, she's the most beautiful creature you'll ever see in your life. Uh, she'll be 19. <laughs> she'll be heading to university, maybe. And my greatest hope is that she's competing on a level playing field. My greatest hope is that something would have happened in our society and it would have shifted my son-in-law's mind sufficiently that as a white father to a mixed race child he would finally have the intelligence to tell her you no longer need to pretend to be white in order to be successful mm. wow wow thank you both for your time for your insights for your stories i feel like i only scratched the surface in doing justice in this conversation I truly cannot thank you enough. For all of our colleagues listening in right now, Paul recently published a blog, and we're happy to send it around afterwards, in an open letter. It was titled, Waiting to Exhale, If One of Us Can Breathe, None of Us Can Breathe. And I hope that today's session, along with everything else that we're doing as individuals and as a company, just remind us that we all have a role to play in ending racial discrimination, racial injustice, even though none of us probably started, none of us started it centuries ago, but we all have a very, very important role to play. Thank you all so much for your time and please feel free to reach out to DNI at any time. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye everyone.